Always wonderful worshiping with this community of faith. Good being with you today. I wonder how many of you might know of someone that when you think about them, as far as you're concerned, they are a serious, not solemn, but serious and mature Christian. And you say that because when you look at their life, it's obvious to you that it's obvious to them that their faith is important to them. They know what they believe and they have the behavior to back up and verify those beliefs. So they're talking the faith and they are walking the faith. They are the kind of person that in many respects uh, you would say is uh, a person that is quite mature in their faith. Again, they know what they believe and why they believe. And even though they might have had, and some would say, oh, but folks like that just have a fair weather faith. Have you ever heard of that, having a fair weather faith? Okay. Actually, what you know about that person is that indeed, they know firsthand the ups and downs of life. They know the hurts and the heartaches of life and none of that really has either crushed or challenged the core of their Christian convictions. They know who they are, they believe, they know who God thinks they are, and for that, they are well and spiritually satisfied as mature Christians. So, when we gather on a season like Advent, one of the things that I look at is that oftentimes I've known people like that through the years, and I've oftentimes kind of identified those kinds of mature, serious Christians as seasoned Christians. And I say that because I've noticed that one of the things that happens in the development of their faith is that they realize that the seasons of the Christian year are important to them. They know how to use each season throughout the Christian year to deepen and to develop their faith. So it seems to me they are a seasoned Christian because every season has importance to them and they try to observe that season and acknowledge it and to use it well and wisely. Today, as we have been told and in singing and reading, we enter the season of Advent. The other seasons that follow Advent are Christmas, and then Epiphany, and then we have Lent and Easter and Pentecost. And just to remind ourselves, in the midst of all of those seasons interspersed throughout the Christian year, we have a lot of different kind of individual Sunday observances that we acknowledge as well, like Christ the King Sunday and All Saints Sunday. But on the first Sunday of the season of Advent, we light the first Christmas, excuse me, first Advent candle. And this is for us the Advent candle of hope. But do you know what also we can do on the first Sunday of Advent? We can share with each other these words. Happy New Year. <laughs> Because in the Christian tradition, the first Sunday of Advent starts our new Christian year. So, Happy New Year. Now, Advent basically is the word that means coming, the coming of the Christ child into the world. But one of the things that I think we have to realize is that the season of Advent, it's a season of preparation, but why do we have to prepare? Well. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that there's nothing natural or normal about the God that we know about. Oftentimes we characterize and use such words as God is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, okay? Kind of high-powered words. And yet for the season of Advent, we say, oh no, God comes in a cradle in the shape of a child just like you and just like me. So there's nothing really natural or normal about this God. And the season of Advent reminds us God is doing something new, something different. So we have to pay attention. So God wasn't kidding when God decided to come as a kid. Okay? Wasn't kidding. And so that means that we have to ponder and probe the questions 
If God comes to us in a child, in the shape of a child, just like you and me came into this world, then what does God want us to know about God? Okay? What is God trying to tell us about God, trying to tell us about ourselves when God comes to us in the shape of a child? Same thing is true with the season of Lent. Lent is a season of preparation, is it not? And what we try to do is to prepare ourselves for the unimaginable, incredible understanding and belief that God comes to us not only in a cradle, but now on a cross. And on that cross, we see a disfigured, humiliated Savior. And so Lent tries to help us figure out how do we understand the reality of God not only in a child, but now in a cross, in this humiliated figure. What are we to make of God who comes in that way? I remember someone saying, Advent reminds us that God comes in small packages. Lent reminds us that God comes in strange packages. And if we're gonna hang around this kind of God very long, then we have to be prepared. One of the things I think what we are reminded of is that Christ comes both in a cross and found on a cradle. But we're going to have to ponder what that means because there is no such thing as instant Christianity or being an instant Christian. It just doesn't happen. It didn't happen to the disciples. It took them a long time, three plus years, and even after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, they still quite weren't sure what was going on related to Christ. The same is true for us. We have to ponder, we have to probe, we have to pray, we have to prepare so that we can practice the life of Christ in the life that you and I live, okay? That's what we're about, particularly in the season of Advent. Now for some, Advent basically is a precursor to Christmas. It's kind of a bit of a distraction, okay, till we really get to the good stuff, okay? So, all right, I'll put up with four Sundays before I get to get to Christmas, but, for us as Christians, being a seasoned Christian means we use the season of Advent to understand what we are all about. Advent, I think, helps us to reduce the frantic activity that many of us can participate in this time of year. It also helps us reduce the exhaustion that many of us can feel this time of year. So Advent says, no, it's not about Santa Claus coming to town but rather it's about God coming in Christ. And so we remind ourselves that Santa Claus isn't going to change the world, but Christ did and continues to do so as well. In our gospel text this morning, we read from the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew, you will remember, was written at a time when the Jews had just obliterated, destroyed the temple in the city of Jerusalem. Okay? The house of God no longer existed. It was gone. It was totally demolished. Mm -hmm. And also, as Matthew was writing, many of the first Christians that actually knew Jesus or knew about him were dying off as well. So the early disciples were really desperate and discouraged about what it was they were to do until Jesus returned. Does that make sense? Okay. So when Matthew writes... He's writing to a very discouraged, desperate group of folks, particularly Christians in the city of Jerusalem, who see that the earliest followers are dying off, the house of God has been obliterated. Now what happens? What are they to do? Well, Matthew basically says, here's what's taking place. Jesus is coming back, but only God knows when. What do you think? Would you be happy with that answer? Would that kind of say, all right, that makes sense to me. I'm just going to live my life like I normally did. I think I would want a little bit more, wouldn't you? But as I've read church history, there have been a lot of folks who basically have tried to determine when Jesus' ETA is going to happen. Lots and lots of schemes and scams over the centuries have been created to try to predict the date, time, day, and place that Jesus would return. One of the more favorite uh, predictors was a guy by the name of William Miller, lived in the 1844, had a group of people that followed him called the Millerites. 
William Miller thought that on October 24, 1844, Jesus would return after looking at all of Scripture that he could kind of predict and turn to. He was sure that was the date and time. Okay? So many of the Millerites actually sold everything they had, got rid of all their clothing, dressed up in white sheets, and climbed up into trees so that they would be closer to being taken up into heaven. Well, after the sun went down, and no pun intended, the Millerites were up a tree, <laughs> they realized that, in fact, another guess had failed. And at this point, all the guesses have failed as well. None of them have ever been accurate. So if you get something in the mail that says, we've got it figured out when Jesus is returning, just remember what Jesus says in Matthew, yeah, I'll be back, but only God knows when, okay? Barbara Brown Taylor in a wonderful story on this particular passage says that uh, Matthew would laugh at the idea that humans could figure out when Jesus would return. It's kind of like thinking that a thief would call you and say, say, when is a good time for me to come and break into your home, okay? Would uh, Monday morning work or if not, how about Thursday morning? It's just not something that we can do. So, what's going to happen? What do we do while we wait? That's the interesting question I thought the disciples would have asked, but it's not clear that they did. Basically, Jesus says, nobody knows when I'm going to come. So, that's what the disciples heard. Now, if I was a disciple, I would have asked Jesus, okay, what do I do while I wait? Okay, what are we supposed to be up to? And Jesus, again, basically said, you don't know when it's going to come. Do you remember in the reading of uh, Matthew, Jesus makes reference to Noah. And all the people that were living at that time were living life like they normally live life, like we normally live life. They had no idea that the flood was coming, so you just don't know. But in the end, Jesus says, you have to be prepared. Well, how is it that you get prepared? So, Martin Luther, remember, was one of the principal figures in the Protestant Reformation. Luther was one asked, Martin, if someone came up to you and said that Jesus had returned, what would you do? Luther said, well, you know what? If I was out in the countryside planting a tree and someone came up and said, Luther, the Jesus has returned, you know what I'd do? I'd finish planting the tree and then I'd go see if Jesus had returned. So what that means basically is that we have to pay attention to the life that we have been given as best we can and some would even say that Christians that pay attention are really the ones that are going to kind of be the mature Christian. By paying attention, that means that we basically have to kind of invest ourselves in a lifestyle that Jesus lived, and in doing that, then we compare that lifestyle with what's going on in the rest of the world, and we begin to realize that we don't get as distracted, okay? As someone said, it's very easy to get distracted in our world because what happens is that we start getting Christmas music in most places right after Halloween, right? So how not could we not get distracted? But when we don't, we basically are saying, I'm going to invest my life in the lifestyle that I understand Jesus to be living. And in doing that, my understanding is that God will continue to reveal to me the many signs of hope, love, peace, and joy that are out there for me to experience. Quick example of how I get distracted. My wife does a wonderful job of creating a list before she goes out to get something. And with that list in hand, she goes in, she gets everything, and pretty much what she has on that list is what she ends up leaving with. Me, I have a list. It's a mental list, okay? It's up in this finely tuned brain of mine. And so a few days ago, I was heading out wanting to get Doria uh, uh, chips. And I don't know, you ever been to a grocery store lately? Do you know how many chips there are out there? Oh my gosh, I was just looking for one package and I walked in from here to the wall up to about 10 feet. There are thousands of different types of chips and I'm wondering, do we need all of this, really? Is it that important? But here's what happens. I start looking at everything and then I don't see anything, okay? And that's how I think I sometimes get distracted. I'm not kind of looking at the things that God in many respects calls me to look for. 
So recently, here's what I have been looking for and have seen some glimmers and glimpses of God's presence in my life. Having lunch downtown Portland, just enjoying with my wife eating, a young man sits down, has an infant baby there, sets down his lunch. And for the next 45 minutes, that young man just stares at his infant child. Doesn't eat anything, he is just focused on that child. And you can see the love that he has for that child. For me, that's a glimpse of the reality of God that I was able to pay attention to. Does that make sense? Okay. So you have to pay attention. You have to kind of think, okay, what's out there? How do I not get distracted? How is it that I don't look at everything but look at particular things? And for me, that was a real glimmer of God, that young man's profound love for his newborn infant. Another that I saw recently is that in Thanksgiving, families can be so supportive and caring of one another. They can really come through for one another, just provide a sense of reinforcement in a life that's oftentimes distraught and really struggling. Families can really, really make a difference for others. I also think that there are times when um, we have conversations that are really hard to have even in a community of faith, even in the church, even in this church, where we might have to share things that are discomforting, maybe even discouraging to one another, but you know what, we can do it because we have a more profound faith of the love that we have for one another and we can share hard things, okay? The church can do hard things. We can listen to each other and love even though we might be discouraged and discomforted about what is being said. One of the spiritual directors that I used to work with said, maybe in the Advent season, this is what you could do and do it every day, do it every morning before you even get out of bed. Share these words. God, today, make me more attentive of you being in my life. Just that. Simple statement for anything happens to the day. God, today, make me more attentive of you being in my life. And when we do that, I found that it makes me realize that the reality of God, I start with each day, but I've got some accountability to pay attention as well. So it might be something in the season of Advent that you may want to start for yourself. See if you just share those words, God, today, Make me more attentive of how you are present in my life and see what happens. What I hope happens in the season of Advent as we pay attention. Some would say that the first step in being a spiritually mature person is to pay attention, okay? That when we do that, our confidence is increased that God is trying to greet us each and every day, okay? And we can see that and believe it, feel it, and hear it because we are simply paying attention. Matthew told us that wise people are not folks that are going to try to read the mind of God and figure out when Jesus is going to return. Matthew told us that really wise people are those who invest themselves in the very lifestyle of Jesus. And then you begin to see things and feel things you never thought was possible. So today, let me be maybe the first to again wish you Happy New Year. And what do you think? Are we paying attention? Amen.